Hello, today's Studio Sense lesson is a pastel painting called Winter's Transition. First, we'll start with a competition. We'll do our lattice framework, focus on lines, identify that focal point, and focus on building those masses. So what I'm doing here is mapping out, I've already put the lattice framework on the blank pastel sandpaper surface. You can see the uh, breakout of thirds, both vertical and horizontal, and also the diagonal lines that I've built uh, from the corners of the pastel surface. The reference photo is in the upper right, and that reference photo is laid out in such a way that the horizon is actually about at the halfway point uh, on the horizontal axis, and we don't want that. We want to restructure the landscape, and this is what I would encourage all of my students to do is um, if you're using a reference photo, take a look at it, move the masses around to whatever you think is such much more pleasing painting. Have that focus focal point defined ahead of time. And in this particular case, the focal point is right where my hand is right now, right about where there's an X there, the lower third horizontal line meeting up with the um, left third vertical line, right about there where the lines are converging. I like to use lines in my in my compositions that reasonably follow the patterns of the lattice network that I've put on the canvas. And in this particular case, the horizontal line from the lower left is, is leading us up through that. It's a frozen trail, trail of ice, and it's leading up to the focal point, which is really the brightest part of the sky and a dark tree, a tree that was in the shade uh, up uh, on the uh, left there, so in the in the focal in the in the in the photograph, the rest of the lines are pretty much what I'm blocking in roughly with pastel. This is like a light purple pastel. Is the um, structure of the clouds? Now, when I looked at this photograph, uh, I originally started designing it with the horizon at the halfway point or a little above the halfway point, and I realized that. One of the main features of this painting, or this reference photograph that really attracted me, was the sky itself. The sky was very dramatic, so I decided, hey, this is really a painting about sky, and a lot of dark shade, darkness, because the sun is not hitting this most of the other area of this painting. And let's, let's convey that in this particular um, piece of art. So that's the approach I took in terms of restructuring the composition. So I'll continue blocking in portions of the shaded areas of the clouds. And this is really just to get a simple sense of the main features of the painting. And rethinking the layout, again, I'm going to just reinforce the fact that there, the reference photo has a horizon cut about in half that's on the left. On the right is the version that I used in terms of the, this is a pastel sketch as the basis for the painting. So again, we're focusing on the sky here. On the acrylic underpainting, I'll apply a deep purple in the shaded areas. And what I would like to do is to provide the complementary or apply the complementary acrylic color to the orange where the sun is hitting the, um, the horizon area and the trees in the back. So I'll use a really vibrant blue Acrylic. And the purpose of this acrylic, so we know that there's very dark values in probably maybe almost two-thirds of this reference photograph, the foreground and both sides, the right and the left, of that icy path. So I like the dark, dark purple acrylic because the colors that are in the landscape in those areas are deep reds, some browns, um, and mauve type colors. And I thought they would go well with a deep purple background. So, so as you can see here, I'm applying acrylic, not too thickly, but there's a few spots where I'll add a little bit of impasto touch to that acrylic paint. And, and uh, that'll create a very interesting pastel surface when the pastel is applied on top of that. The, the, um, so we'll block in this whole area with acrylic, and of course acrylic dries pretty quickly, and it dries pretty much to the color that 
uh, the value that you've applied as opposed to watercolor, which would lighten up. So you have to rethink think about how you apply watercolor if you're using a watercolor underpainting. Uh, but this worked out pretty well. It's very simple. You know, when you look at this reference photos, there's really simple masses here. Here we're going to bring in the uh, pastels once the underpainting is done. And I'm going to work with the sky first. And, and we had a little bit of a um, video issue here. The, the light blue of the, <laughs> the distant horizon was placed without being uh, uh, recorded here, but that's that's okay. The, um, the sky is going to be first here. And the reason why I'm doing the sky first, and in many cases you'll want to start off with the sky, is, is, is simply the, the dust from the pastel will fall. If you had done the lower portion of the painting first, the dust will fall on that. And it, it's it's not necessarily a big issue. Uh, it could be some, somewhat problematic at points, depending on the level of the values that you have down below. If they're really light values, like a snow surface, and, and they can get dirty from the pastel up above. So I'd like to start with the sky, especially since the sky is the focal point of this this painting, or the main focal points of the painting. So I'll work to the clouds first. I use a variety of kind of dark purple gray uh, in the sky, mauves, some pinks, and the uh, blue obviously is what I'm blocking in here first because again the clouds will overlap. If you will, the blue, the blue sky is 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 really the background, I guess, if you will, for <laughs> a sky. Uh, landscape. So the um, darks, uh, the dark mauve type colors are what I focused on uh, applying the uh, the uh, clouds. The top of the blue, uh, the top of the sky being the darker shade of blue. And I, I used, uh, what I'm using here, and you don't see it very well in the video, but I'm using a pan pastel sponge. Uh, pan pastels have a variety of tools blending tools that uh, you've seen in some of my other videos and this is a, a, a like an oblong sponge and I'm applying the blue blonde. It's, it's a really interesting tool. So I'll start with that at the top where the sky is the bluest and then I'll um, work some uh, other pastels, uh, stick hand pastels uh, on, a, on a variety of the other clouds here. Notice the, uh, the light though. The light What's interesting about the light in this painting is that it is coming from behind this scene, behind me, taking the photograph. So this is facing westward, and it's about 7.30 in the morning. So the the sun is actually not rising from that focal point, but it's it's in the opposite area. But because the, the clouds... Uh, because of the variety of the clouds and the strength of the clouds in this particular reference photo, they reflected so much light that it almost looked like sunrise was ha happening out there at the focal point when it was not. So I'll work back and forth on the, on the blues here just to get the basic blue sky in and then start working with my other cloud colors. Again, I'm working the darks first and I'm doing my clouds. And in many cases, we're doing dark first anyway in a pastel painting and the lights on top to build that that depth uh, for the piece of art. So it was a pretty strong light source and it, and it really attracted my attention and that's uh, what I decided to, uh, why I decided to focus on the sky. The pinks are going to come in now. I think I'm bringing in some pink colors and the, the sky itself uh, will be, um, this is where the, the fingers of the pastel artist come in really handy in terms of blending um, pastels. Again, we want it very ethereal, very smooth and transitional in the sky. Uh, there's a few sharp sky and cloud points, but, but most of it is very soft. And the, the light you'll see as we get toward the end of this painting is well, I start playing with light as a form of composition. And what I mean by that is the brightest part of this reference photo is that that lower left side. You see where that little dark rounded edge tree is at the edge, at the end of the ice trail. 
that's really the brightest part. But what was interesting, as I looked at the photo a little further, that there was a very nice glow of light coming from the um, that area and heading up diagonally up toward the left where you see that that old light blue uh, acrylic um, tree outline uh, painted there on the left and you'll see how it's it's kind of fun when you get to the point where you've you've you put all the pastel down you've got a basic painting and then you could start really playing around with it and showing some various modifications and nuances where you could bring a glow of light here or there, or a reflection of light uh, from a particular uh, item in the landscape. And it, it, it's really, um, the fun part is uh, pastel is doing that. This is not so much the fun part, although covering the pastel to get started is, is, is enjoyable. But, you know, the, there's a certain level of impatience to you when you kind of see what this thing's going to look like uh, as you progress. So I've begun to do the blending here, and, and I have a preference for wearing a, a glove. There are artists, and actually for years, I would just uh, blend with my fingers, and uh, it kind of gets rough on your fingers after a while, especially using uh, what I'm using here for a surface, which is a UART 400 grade uh, pastel sandpaper. So uh, wear gloves if you can. I've, I've tried different tools. Um, Pertilons work pretty well to blend. Um, I like blending with pastel pencils, which you'll, you'll see some of that later. Um, and various uh, sponge tools you can use. Uh, but I do, I do like using the fingers, but wearing gloves uh, and it works, works quite well. The blue, again, you've got to be careful that the values of the sky are transition very smoothly from lighter to dark. And that's where blending using your fingers uh, comes in most handy. You can see I'm using a light purple here. Uh, it was a, sort of a purple gray darkness to the clouds, uh, but this particular color and value really gave most of the shape of that, that sky. Uh, most of the character of that sky was this type of color that was uh, in the landscape of the sky. And, and you'll see as we move forward is what I like to do, uh, and, it, and it comes in definitely handy, is to apply a color. Uh, let's say I'm applying a, a purplish color, a light purple color here up in the, in the clouds. I want to see that color somewhere else in the painting. Uh, and not, not just a small little spot, but uh, some mass, not a, a modest mass amount that, that people will be able to see. And it helps create balance uh, in the painting. So we'll bring some of those sky colors into the ground. And again, the ground in some areas is reflecting the sky, especially the icy path. The uh, cloud structure follows along pretty interestingly with the lattice uh, structure of the sketch that was on the blank uh, piece of paper here, the, the diagonals. That we saw. So, you know, again, look at the the large left streak of of clouds. Not the far left, uh, not the far right. I'm sorry, but the, the one second from the right. And that almost kind of corresponds with that diagonal line that I had uh, put that you could barely see any longer. Um, here, I'm doing some of the lighter colors. Uh, again, the lightest spot was down toward that little rounded tree at the end of the ice path. So that's really the strongest light source. The path itself, being that it was ice, is also going to reflect a fair amount of that sky, even though it kind of kind of gets a little bit gray, grayer, if you will, toward the front part of the path, closer to the uh, the bare ground in the in the foreground. So um, again, I'll just keep working this, and and the shapes, which are really pretty fascinating in the sky, the streaks of of clouds and that's where blending will also come in handy and the the light is is reflecting real strongly up in these clouds toward the edges and if you look carefully at the reference photo you can see how you know the sky closer to the horizon is more of a greenish blue 
And that actually gets gives me the opportunity to grab one of my, uh, I call them the, the Blue Lagoon pastels because I, I don't use them too much unless I, unless I paint them in the, in the tropics. But uh, there are parts of the sky that, uh, toward the horizon, that will have that greenish blue look. And I, you should really take advantage of that uh, in building that into your, your um, sky, if in fact the sky um, has such of that character. So in this particular case, I'm just bringing the streaks of, of clouds out further. I'm using a pastel that's not white. I don't use white much at all in my paintings. It does cool off the colors a bit, mutes them somewhat, but I'm using some very light blues, uh, very light uh, pinks, and uh, um, an orange uh, here and there uh, in the painting to build some highlights. I'm applying the pastel strokes very loosely here and I'm using, you'll notice I'm using the sides of the pastel. And, and that's where we want to kind of avoid drooling clouds, if you will, right? So you want to kind of use the side of the pastel, blot the color, onto the surface, uh, blend it in again, it's the sky, so there's going to be a lot of blending in this sky. The, um, the pastels themselves, they get dirty, as we all know. So if you use a set of pastels, you can almost, when I look at my um, pastel box, uh, they're colors that have gotten so dirty, I can't really tell which color they are. So I use a, uh, a cloth uh, rag, small, I cut up some small rags, and I wipe them clean. Uh, before I apply them, certainly to a sky when we have high value, very light colors. You don't want any dark colors to show up like browns in that sky, for example. And it works It works fairly well. Uh, again, using the sides of the pastels, blending with the fingers. Um, you don't want any sharp points in that sky. Everything was very muted uh, and, uh, um, and blend, blended. So at this point, I think I've got a pretty nice glow to that sky. So I'm uh, pretty happy with that. The uh, can't wait to get rid of some of those really bold, bright blues, though, right? So uh, so uh, those those we're going to start getting rid of now. Again, we have looking at the uh, uh, reference photo, the uh, tree line off to the right, the second right half of the uh, reference photo. Um, just a bunch of trees, and we're going to start off with more of a contrast at the edge of the top edge and bring in lighter colors, lighter orange. The purpose of this particular underpainting is to reflect some of the complementary color of the pastel that will be applied on top of it. And that, as I mentioned, that helps the pastel color pop a bit. There's a lot of orange in this particular painting in the in the distance it's a strong orange it's such a contrast with the shaded moths purples and browns uh, of the foreground so um, so we're gonna we're gonna bring in some uh, interesting light uh, orange color in here and continue to build the brightness against the shaded area uh, in the in the painting here, here's the, this is a hard Rembrandt pastel, and uh, it's, it's pretty much a high value orange, uh, maybe mid to high value orange. And, and that is beginning to pick up, and we'll see throughout the painting, and doing this painting, how, how the, the landscape will pick up parts of that um, brilliant sky, little, little, very subtle, um, glows uh, as we move away from this the uh, the bright sky, uh, but, but uh, we'll, we'll bring in even lighter oranges. Here in particular is the the lightest value orange that I'll use today. In addition to um, using some very bright orange uh, pastel pencils to work with uh, blending some of that distance, and, uh, and and you'll notice also. Notice the tree on the left, the, the light orange tree on the left. In the reference photograph, the edge of that tree is a little bit darker than the uh, um, 
brighter parts that, than, the, than the base, than the bulk of the tree, if you will. So it's picking up a little bit of edging. So we'll want to convey that edging of that tree a bit with a slightly darker uh, orange, which I'm doing here. Uh, as it and it looks that way too when you look at it versus this bright sky it, it appears the, the branches appear darker at that point than they do within the bulk of that light tree so that's something that we want to uh, make sure that we convey so uh, and in doing this we're adding some dimension to the tree with the dark uh, in the foreground of that 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 we call this the new the new rounded tree on the left if you will uh, and some of the light uh, areas it's catching the sun again coming from toward us where we're watching this painting it's coming from behind or from the east and this is facing west the um, this plastic palette knife comes in really handy to do some blending it helps push the color in the surface of the, uh, the pastel paper I find that uh, tortillons kind of pick up the pastel and uh, it kind of shakes off a bit. So that's why I like using this um, palette knife to, to really blend some of that, uh, those, uh, those pastel colors. And again, using, using the fingers uh, to uh, reinforce that. You can see some of the blue showing up behind the pastel. We're going to try to leave that in there uh, because the uh, whole point of having that brilliant blue is to um, reflect the complementary color to help it pop, if you will, better. The foreground is very dark. Now, people have asked, do I use black in my paintings? And my answer is yes, to a certain extent. In a very dark uh, environment, I'll, I'll, I may throw in black, or, but then I'll cover it or break it up a bit with a, another dark value of like a purple or a deep, deep brown, orange, brown, orange type color, deep orange color. Because there, there's really, the black that you see in an actual landscape is probably nothing other than charcoal or, or ash, for example. You don't really see black. Um, but often I'll, I'll use a dark, a black color uh, simply to um, take advantage of building on top of that other dark values. It's kind of like a reminder that, hey, this is a dark spot. I'm going to throw a little bit of black. You will see that I'll use some black on the stalks. There are cattails in this reference photo. So we've got to take care of those somehow. And when they're up against the bright sky, they almost look black. So we'll use a variety of, uh, of uh, dark pastels uh, for those. And I have a little bit of deep black in there too. Uh, deep black. black is black, right? So we'll have some of that too in the in the uh, lines of those particular stalks. The light from the distance is is kind of enveloping over the edge of the trees, the dark tree a bit. So that's why we're seeing some light glow there on the lower left along that icy path. Now let's bring some of that color out to the field. Now the field, if you squint. We squint and look at the values of the reference photo. Um, obviously, the the darkest is on that in that area on the left, and the field is the next darkest. But it's it's reasonably light. It's it's probably not a whole lot different from the values of the bright orange tree line, just a little bit darker than that. So let's not make that too dark there. We do have to bring in some light, and it's a different color. This is a um, this is actually one of my favorite pastels. It's a great American pastel, soft pastel, and it's a pinkish mauve kind of color. But it worked really well. I thought it worked really well with that uh, particular landscape. And as I mentioned before, we want to bring some of the sky into the field, so you could see some of the blues that I've I've left on the lower right. Uh, there's some blue in there. Um, and we have a little bit of that orange at the top of the um, flat field here. The field was just a field of stalks and grasses. I don't think it was corn, but I have just a lot of, uh, of um, cattails and um, tall stalks. The distance here, again, we want to help 
sort of define the edge of the of the flat horizon, if you will. So let's bring this pastel through. Again, this is another great American artworks. And notice how I'm applying the pastel, sort of not like across from lines, but also up and down uh, to create some variety in the landscape. This whole area will be covered with those stalks, and we're not going to be drawing those stalks in, in, uh, throughout the whole landscape, obviously. We're just going to suggest that those stalks are there based on uh, the patterns that we paint with, with the pastel. So I think the last part of this um, pastel service that doesn't have pastel on it is, in fact, the icy path. So let's start getting some deep blues in there and some of those grays. And this will be another opportunity to draw the uh, viewer's attention toward that white sky and that dark little rounded tree at the end of the path by highlighting portions of this icy path along the edge of the dark ground. Here I'm taking a very light blue pastel. Uh, this is a uh, not vision pastel very light blue, and uh, picking up some of the highlights in the icy path that are reflected from the bright sky. Again, more around the edges to draw attention, breaking up the masses a little bit in the distance. That path really just uh, um, turned off to the left, so you can see a little bit of that uh, happening there uh, toward the dark tree at the end. The path itself was kind of rounded down, so the, the center of the path was the highest point, and then the edges just kind of dropped off a bit. There's actually a small stream on, on the left, which was frozen, and on the right there's a pond. Uh, after after the cattails, a bit of ground, then you hit water. So it all kind of drifted off. Uh, on this light pastel that I'm using, that I used uh, on the path, I'm going to bring some of that color and into the distance where it's picking up more of that bright sky uh, at the edge of that particular field. And, and uh, the, the field, you know, I was really happy with the, um, the colors and the values that I used in the, in the field. Basically a bunch of mid to low values, a lot of shade. We don't want to get into much detail there. But back and forth, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to refine the painting build contrasts like I just did here with a little bit of a darker brown orange color against that lightness and uh, play with along play along with the horizon and some of the blending sorry my hands kind of in the way of, of, of what's happening here the uh, uh, edges of those um, that tree line in the back is going to be picking up a lot of more of the glow, if you will, from the sky. So we've been building some of that in and some of the other colors. The trees itself, the trees definitely need tree holes or sky holes, right? Uh, obviously, you should be able to see within or through the tree. Uh, the trees, what's interesting about these trees, it appears that they're, you know, they're, they're orange leaves, but they're not. They're, they're really dense um twigs, uh, branches, and sticks that um, have picked up so much color from the sunrise behind us that it's, they almost look like they've got leaves on them. But we have to be careful to kind of break them up a bit. Now the reference photo, on the uh, in the reference photo, the tree line on the right does look pretty dense. You don't see many gaps in that. But the tree on the left, we're going to have to work that a bit further. We'll bring in some sky holes. And also, we have to build a little more dimension than I'm doing here, because the strongest light, the strongest light coming from the sunrise, was the upper portion of that that tree that I'm working on here, and uh, also the, the the horizon, the base uh, on the left tree line, where the strongest light is is hitting uh, these trees. And there's also a tree behind that, uh, let's see that little dark tree at the end of the trail, there's another tree, several trees back there that are picking up also the direct sunlight. Again, building contrast, the dark um, 
trees and shrubs uh, in the foreground. Um, working with, again, the side of the pastel, and I find if I have a preference for pastel types, and, and if you're shopping around for pastels, I really recommend pastels with um, uh, angular edges. So rectangular pastels are great because you can easily use the sides of them to create lines. Uh, you can't do that so much with uh, rounded pastels. So, so I prefer the, the those with edges. But Mount Vision has uh, a great variety of large pastels, and, and they're, they're, they're hard as well as soft in the, in the sense that the hard edges can easily be used to sketch out edges and sharp lines like I'm doing here with the edge of the pastel. As I mentioned earlier, I like to use pastel pencils for blending. It's interesting the set of pastel pencils I have, I think I only have like 12, but four of them are like orange, <laughs> orange colors. So this came in handy in creating the effect of the spillover of the light from that distance. Notice how I've applied the uh, pastel across that dark mass, that little tree dark mass at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the path. And I'm blending a little bit further here uh, to create that spillover effect, which we'll call it, uh, of the, uh, the lighting. It comes in really handy. You don't lose color. Um, it, it has a nice effect uh, by using the colored pastel pencil as a blending tool. Some of these masses, you know, the masses are pretty emphatic, so we'll need to continue working on breaking them up a bit. Uh, so that can be done by either extending, again, extending that uh, icy path off way, in, and you'll see a little bit later how I'll be breaking up some of the, uh, uh, the not only the, the foliage on the left, but also that uh, little tree in the, at the end of the trail. Bringing in, again, more of the uh, reflective light here. This is a, I like to use a purple, it's a light purple hard pastel. And this is an old new pastel from like 20 years ago that uh, I still haven't used up. Again, the moths and the soft pastels are being layered on. You're using your, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're particular about your pastels, you can always start off with the hard pastels. In fact, those are great to do an underpainting, uh, washing them out, blending them with uh, isopropyl alcohol. But then we'll want to use our softer pastels as we layer on the the pastel layer on dimensions in the painting. That is a, uh, uh, you can see that is a, uh, a, a uh, Mount Vision pastel. There was uh, more ice um, and snow uh, in the shaded area here, so I'm bringing that in, but again, it's a deeper value, it's a darker value, obviously, than the path, so you really want to mute that down. You don't want it to be too distracting, but notice how it is kind of directing us again toward the end of that path, reasonably, reasonably parallel to the uh, icy path. You'll notice that I just tend to grab different pastels and work different parts of the painting. So at this point, the whole painting is covered with pastel. We've got the basics down, we've got the masses down. Even we have actually more of the basics down. This is um, the painting, we might want to call it like two-thirds done at this point. Uh, we could get into an argument as to when a painting is done or when you should stop a painting. And a lot of variations in the painting are really the preference of the artist. They're not necessarily, they're not really needed. But you can just kind of keep adding them in and, and, and uh, we'll do some of that here. Trying to add a little more dimension to foliage. There actually is foliage in there. You can see in the reference photo. There's stalks and there's some horizontal and vertical line around. There are darker spots in the field uh, as opposed to lighter spots. And there's also some icy spots too. And here's a, there's a blue pastel that will bring in some of those ice patches. And again, this area here on the right, the ice patches kind of all drifted down toward a pond, a frozen pond, which you do not see in this landscape. And I'll add a little bit of dimension and variety to this, uh, to the ice on the path. So I'll bring it out a little bit further here and there. 
it almost looks rep repetitive. Uh, we try not to be repetitive like that with those three strokes, so we'll break up those a bit too. And add a little more highlights. Some parts of that ice will pick up more light than other parts. So that's what this light, very light, very, very light blue <laughs> pastel that is doing. We can, I, did, I didn't use any white in this uh, particular painting. Again, break up some of the, the edges there. The, uh, you know, nature is chaotic. So there's there's uh, uh, there's a lot of variety in it. You don't have many in the world, much in the way of straight lines at all. Uh, so, so you need to be mindful of that. Again, using the side of the pastel and really just continued refinement of the painting. There's no rhyme or reason why I'll pick up a particular pastel and work on a certain spot of the painting versus another. So you can just, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, use your imagination. The, the, the um, reference photo becomes less important at this point, other than the fact that, again, what I'm doing here is putting some of the, the lines or the branches in the tree. There are some bright branches that are really picking up some light. So we've got to get some of that dimension in the tree and then sky holes to make it a little more realistic. But as I was saying before, there's no real rhyme or reason why I'm picking up my pastels at various points. Just uh, from a, like a, um, just to explain how this video was done, I'm recording uh, various pastel strokes and then I'll stop. So, th so this particular video is probably composed of probably a hundred pauses of the of the recording to get another stick of pastel, or to stand back and look at the painting and decide, hey, what's going to be next? I'm bringing in some uh, purple pastel pencil in here. When I have a dark shaded area in the fall or the winter, I like to use browns, dark oranges, purples. Uh, in the landscape, even some reds, and I think I did bring a little bit of red here in the left, on the left tree line. But anyway, so you stand back, you look at the painting, you decide what you want to do, and, and while I'm doing that, I stop the recording, so I'm coming back. So so uh, even though the, the the video itself is about an hour and 40 minutes, it's, it's probably twice that amount of time that I actually spent doing this particular painting continuing to work back and forth, identifying where I think the light from the sky is going to bounce off of that field. And that's why you see some of those lighter values of the field on the right. Here again, bringing in the darker edge of that tree. Um, and, and right now it still looks like it's too much of a drawn tree. We want to we want to loosen that tree up and show some sky holes. So we'll get to that at some point. The, uh, the yeah, palette knife, again, comes in handy in softening those edges, but again, they do look a bit darker than the inside part of the tree. And we'll even brighten that up even a bit uh, further as we, as we refine the painting. So you'll notice that now, if you look at the light orange, the light orange in the lower third, right at the left edge of that tree line there, that's to the right of that little dark tree, uh, and the Right, bright orange at the top of the tree on the left. What I'm going to do as we move forward with this, I'm going to modify the sky a bit further to, to show more of that light arc, if you will, going from the, the tree line on the left, on the right, up to the top of the tree on the left. This can be kind of a fun little nuance of the painting that we'll do. You don't see that in the reference photo, and that's why you get to the point where the reference photo is merely that, a reference photo, right? So I haven't made any major changes to the photo in terms of the, what you see in the picture. It's like I didn't, I didn't take a tree and move it to a different location or anything like that. But it's getting to the point where it's really the artist's imagination and how, how you want this painting to evolve and what you really want to emphasize that, that becomes uh, more important than, than looking at a reference photo. I also like to pick a uh, unique color, kind of spice up the colors in the painting. Uh, so, so you'll see some of those that I'll bring in here, especially the uh, that uh, what are called the lagoon green blue <laughs> that I'll bring up into the uh, into the sky. A little bit of surprise is kind of interesting to see the painting, but 
But for now, we're really just working details back and forth again, pausing, pausing the recording, thinking about what I want to do next, heading back and, and, and trying something different. At some point, I will throw in, well, toward the end of the painting, I'll throw in the cattails and the various, you know, the various twigs that you see on the right. Now, the risk in doing that is distraction. So we don't want them to be too obvious. Well, they're going to be obvious. You're going to see them, but too distracting, too, uh, that we don't, we don't want them to own the painting, if you really want, you don't want the viewer to be stuck on looking at these cattails. So we got to be careful in doing them. Uh, and, and also, we're saving them for, for the end, because we really need to clarify or, or complete, we'll call complete the, the background here uh, on the landscape, and then we'll throw the cattails up on, at, and, the, and the twigs uh, at the end. Here again, I'm breaking up a bit the uh, the masses in the distance and softening them up somewhat with the glow of the light. I think it's time to bring in a uh, artist joke. Because as I've said before in some of these videos, gosh, if you're watching a video for like an hour and a half of someone painting, doesn't it get kind of boring after a while? And it's sort of mesmerizing too. You get kind of somewhat hypnotic <laughs> to watch to watch this uh, happens. Why are most artists struggling with finances? Because they have no Monet. There we go. Here's the first joke. When should you fix a painting? When it's broke. And I think uh, 70 plus best art jokes to go, G-O-G-H, look at. This is the source of jokes for these uh, these videos. Bringing in, again, more highlights here with that very light blue pastel. It literally almost looks white, but it's but it's not. It's, <laughs> and I'll have to believe the, the label that has since been, <laughs> been removed from the, from the pastel. Hey, but, so when you get a new set of pastels, this is what I do. I cut them in half. I usually break them. Um, so I, I like to have a, a duplicates of my pastels on my large pastel tray, if you will, and then uh, pull up uh, uh, the others, the small other that I broke up, the other halves, if you will, onto like a tray or something like that, a smaller uh, pastel box, uh, like a Heilman box that I'll use on top of a tripod in my studio. Right now, I'm starting to break one of my rules. I'm starting to draw lines again. As I'm using the side of this pastel, but but again, we, we do need to show something in the foreground that indicates the vegetation. We'll kind of blend it a bit and break it up somewhat. When you look at stalks, you, you a lot of them appear to be uh, appear to be uh, vertical, but not necessarily so. So we know that we have uh, uh, horizontal stocks uh, as well as vertical stocks. So uh, that uh, that needs to be conveyed. Uh, so broken stocks, if you will. So so at least we've got a start on that uh, level of detail of the painting. Again, we're not going to do too much uh, to emphasize this part, but the variety of the, the stocks themselves change the values in the field a bit uh, with their shadows uh, that you'll see. So uh, you can't, can't really see them in the photograph, but, but they are creating some value and some darkness in certain parts. So we need to kind of figure out how to do that without drawing a bunch of sticks. Uh, so we're softening it up a bit with the portal on. I just don't want them emphasized uh, too strongly. We're really getting to this point now where we can add this type of value, uh, this type of detail. I do like the the layout of the field and the colors and how the 
the light shifts from the brightest portions of that flat field on the right and it just bounces a little bit toward the foreground and it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, in dark dark shade this reference photo I talk, took with my phone and I did not enhance it. What you could do with a digital photo is saturate it to really pick out the colors that maybe you don't quite see um, in the photo itself. Uh, they, were, they were there if you saw them and if you did a plein air painting there you would see those colors but when you saturate um, it really exaggerates, right? Saturate exaggerates as I like to say and it uh, picks up colors that you say wow where'd that come from and uh, but, but you can use that as a reference point, too, to pick up the colors of the pastel painting. You know, I'm softening some of these twigs, stalks with the you know, plastic pastel knife. That works out really well. Again, it pushes the pastel into the painting, and it's easily cleaned, too. I usually, usually keep a little white rag around me, and then I'll dry it off and you know, get the wetness into the, into the room, pastel. Again, highlights start coming into uh, importance at this at this point. Uh, the streaks of clouds there are you can see the edges are lighter uh, in some spots uh, in varied ways. So kind of like an all like puffy clouds sort of along those uh, cloud streaks. So we want to convey some of that with this. Um, light blue pastel, blue Bernard is blue, and uh, um, again, the, as I mentioned before, I want to start doing some composition here with the cloud lighting, uh, so we'll kind of play around with that a bit, and I'll do more so than the actual uh, reference photo is, is telling us. Again, there was orange in the background, we got to bring a little bit of that further in the field so that's a little bit of that orange will be baked in there and we got to be careful not to make it too strong at this point because it's not going to it should not be as a vibrant urban orange obviously that we see in the back and it kind of it gets a bit muted anyway because of the dark background that i just applied that orange to so it's a little softer obviously than the distance Again, building some of that contrast, uh, and there, there was a little bit of pastel dust uh, toward the, the bottom of that sky, so we needed to kind of clean that up a bit uh, and bring in some of those bright colors. Again, you can use like bright pinks, bright oranges. Be careful if you're using a bright yellow when you have blue sky because you'll get your, your green, and, uh, and that's not necessarily fun to see in a sky, unless it's, again, my little blue, blue lagoon green blue green that I'll use shortly. Uh, so again, this is a this is actually a very light, soft pink pastel. And the edge came in handy here to help uh, build some of those light ripples uh, in the uh, the cloud streaks. You sort of see now that there's a, if you will, there's a kind of like an arc of light Again, look at it from the, the top of the bright tree on the left down toward the light part of the tree line on the right, on the left side of that tree line. And what I'll be doing here is I'll be building some of that emphasis and building a little more brightness in that area, almost like a halo, if you will. Now, the part I just did up there is as I look at the reference photo a bit further now on the sky, there are streaks of purple up that way, uh, looking, uh, going opposite the direction of the, the streaks of light that are going diagonally from the lower left to the upper right. So taking advantage of some of that interesting view. And what's uh, really neat is the, is the look of a purple color like that on blue. It's really an interesting combination. Um, again, we'll kind of work some of those designs in the sky. And again, keep, keep blending them back and forth. Um, at this point, we're, I don't have to worry about sky falling on the, uh, the, the colors below because I'm really not doing a whole lot. I'm not making any major changes. By the way, if you did want to do a major change to a pastel a portion of your pastel painting, what I normally do is 
I'll take a, a, a soft paintbrush, usually a narrow paintbrush, and I brush off the pastel on the section that I want to repair. And if I really want it to go totally away, I'll then take a, an eraser um, that, uh, I forget what those erasers are called, but, uh, but I'll remove the rest of the pastel that way and start, start from scratch. Now, now, the problem is you'll have some eraser pieces on your pastel and you need to kind of brush them off somehow. So uh, that also becomes a problem if you're sketching. If you want to sketch for, for designing a composition on the uh, sandpaper and you use your eraser, you've got to get a brush to brush it all off. Otherwise, because uh, I use, uh, I'll, I'll do an under, underpainting and I want to, I want to paint over pieces of eraser. It just doesn't work out very well for me. So, so try to avoid that technical, uh, technical challenge. We're bringing in a bit of a darker blue to the sky. It's sort of like uh, grabbing one of my, some of my favorite pastel colors. You know, you have, you've got favorites, and uh, gee, I've got to use this deep blue because I really like the deep blue favorite. If you will, so I'll bring that in, and that adds contrast to the lighting, to, 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 to the bright clouds. This is uh, one of the green blues that I mentioned earlier. This is a hard pastel. And uh, so we're going to bring some of that in. I have a Senelaire um, deeper blue green pastel I'll bring in shortly. It'll be a little more vibrant. But again, adding variety here, getting the values right, and, uh, and, and showing the interplay of light on these clouds was, uh, was really the fun thing. About this particular pastel painting. So what did the Italian painter who loved spice buy? He bought a chili. Bought a chili, bought a chili. There you go. Bad, bad jokes. This is where I'm, I'm working on some of that arc that I talked about earlier. So the, that rounded the way the lighting fell from the tip of that tree down. So this is one, this is, and this pastel pencil here is one of my favorites. It's a very light, orange, yellow orange, I think it's more of an orange, whitish kind of color, but it works really well in creating a misty effect. Uh, again, so a light value here uh, with the lightness of the sky and the sharp edge of the pastel painting, uh, pastel pencil helped build that uh, glow. Same thing, applying it to the tops of this top of this tree, the, tip, the top part of this tree is really the brightest uh, in the uh, brightest of that tree uh, on the left. So again, I'm bringing in this little glow, and it's adding a very nice contrast to the uh, foreground tree, uh, where, I, where I extended the branches out a bit further into the tree behind it. The, um, the lights again, I'm bringing them into contrast against to the edges of the, uh, the dark edges of the, of the trail. Really, at this point, this is the refinement of the painting, and you kind of go back and forth. You, you stop, you look, you stop stand back, see what difference you want to, differences you want to apply. What I'd like to do is take notes. So let's say I'm done for the day and I leave the painting in progress. I'll photograph it. Then I'll go and uh, I use the, um, 
Google Mail and I use the tasks bar on the right. So if you look at tasks and I label my paintings in my little task set there. So the painting I'm working on is called Winter Transition. And I, and I look at the painting later on uh, on my phone, for example, and I open up my tasks and I add notes as to what I want to modify next time. Uh, and, and it's great. It's a great way of uh, you know, putting the painting aside and um, figuring out uh, well, what, what I want to do with it. And maybe there's something that I see later on in viewing the painting in progress that I didn't notice while I was working on it. Uh, I'm going to have to fix those lines. It looks like they're all uh, uh, parallel, so you need to kind of break those up and create some varieties there. That's a little bit of that there. So I keep this list and I just keep adding to it. So even if I go to the painting for five minutes later on and decide to work a little bit on it, um, I'll, uh, I'll go back and I'll photograph it and then I'll uh, add some more notes and I'll just kind of keep modifying it. And chances are, this painting will see the final version of it uh, in this video, but uh, it's still up on my easel and I'll probably go back to it tomorrow and make some more final adjustments to it. But uh, I want to convey the whole essence of the, of the painting here and the complete uh, design and, and uh, conveyance of this particular early morning scene. Brown pastel pencils, purples, and dark oranges uh, come in handy here. I add a little bit of uh, more, more um, branches to that tree in the back. I thought they were a little bit too strong, so we're going to kind of break them up a bit too uh, to get some more of those sky holes in there. Also break up that uh, small little dark tree at the end of the trail uh, a little bit uh, a little bit further. I think the uh, the tree line on the right, though, I think that's pretty much the way it's going to be. Uh, I kind of like the blue popping out in there, <laughs> and um, uh, maybe a little bit of a uh, lighter orange uh, at the top, uh, picking up against some of the light from the left. Uh, and, and, and enveloping over to the top edge of the uh, that flat tree line on the right, do some of that, bring a little more dimension to that, uh, that tree there on the left with a, a darker orange, um, soft, this is a soft pestle, again using the side of the pestle stick. I can't seem to leave the sky alone, so <laughs> still, still playing around with that. Just a matter of uh, standing back and, and looking at the painting and deciding how I want the pattern of light to to uh, to move uh, along in the in, in the sky. Noticing that the brightest parts of that sky are closer to the obviously the horizon and the, and the trees, so certainly on the tree on the left. This just builds a little bit more contrast. This is actually just a new pastel, a red new pastel. From adding that light, uh, very bright pastel in the sky just a moment ago, I'm now adding a bit of a darker uh, pastel 
to the trees to build that contrast. Again, the edge being a little bit darker and the, uh, and the bulk of the, uh, um, the inside part of the tree or the bulk of the tree. Because that, that's giving it a little bit more dimension. I'm a little happier with that now. And, of course, pastel pencils will help to identify some branches. Some of the branches were, were really catching the light very strongly, so a little bit of that to, to be conveyed in there. This pastel pencil helps pick up that thought. Playing with the edges is, is kind of fun in, in terms of building that contrast with the, uh, with the third part of this particular painting. It really helps it stand out, helps draw your attention to it. Here I thought I wanted to bring even more of that <clears throat> bouncing light uh, from the sky across the field. So I took a slightly lighter value pastel to bring it forward. Um, I also, also have a light pastel. Remember the, the so, so the question is, and here's some of the sky holes, what color those sky holes or what value they should be. And they're usually uh, a slightly darker value than the sky behind it itself because less light because there's smaller apertures between the gaps of the branches the light less light gets through so it's, it looks a little bit darker but i have to be careful to use the colors pretty much that are in that sky but just slightly darker values of those so i'll use uh, the maybe the lightish purple or a darker blue uh, to get there so so that works out pretty well so just just like that breaking up some of those branches continue to do so um, sometimes your pastel will blend a bit, so you need to kind of fix that. But uh, in general, I thought the uh, the sky holes here um, were, were, were working out uh, pretty well to show the fact that this tree had a lot of thinness in it in terms of some of the twigs. Again, working, uh, continuing to work those contrasts and those edges, uh, deepening a bit the uh, that that portion of that tree. I think it was picking up some of the shadow also of the trees in the foreground, the shrubs in the foreground. Um, and there were, and this was a long path, so there are other trees in here and, and blocking the light. So, so there's a fair amount of interplay between shade shadows. Um, and uh, picking up some of the early sun. Don't forget there's sky holes, if you will. We'll call them maybe tree holes in the shrub in that big dark tree uh, shrub there on the left. So we need to show some of the gaps there, and we're going to use a uh, certainly a darker value than we did doing the sky holes of the tree in front um, back there because break up some of the, uh, the branches in that dark mass of tree there on the left. So I step back, I stop the video my recording, I step back and there I go, I grab more blues. Um, so, so this helped to uh, corral, if you will, the brightness of the clouds and, and build even a little more contrast. Now again, I'm going to have to blend this with my, my finger. And, uh, and when you do the, do the blending, by the way, just make sure your, your, uh, your gloves or your fingers are clean uh, before you go and do this. Uh, I think I pick up, I think you'll see actually a little bit later that some of the orange gets picked up in the sky. And I looked at that and I said, oh, I muted it a bit, but 
not too much. I kind of liked it in the sky a little bit, so I left it there. So maybe we'll get to see that in, in a little more, in, a, in a bit. So again, blending, blending it in and uh, smoothing all this blue out because the clouds are sitting on top of the blue, right? So we got to make sure that that is retained. So I'll likely go back and uh, I'll play around with the clouds again and add a little more uh, on top of this, uh, this blue. But uh, I'll put some of the uh, darker sky in here at this point. Here's where I'm I'm working those clouds again just to fluff them up a bit on top of the blue so you can kind of rework a lot of areas too there's there's no science i mean there's there's some artists that uh, i mean they, they may just know exactly what they're going to do step by step and not rework areas just get them done um i don't know who those are but <laughs> but we typically go back and forth and this is of course the fun part you know the fun part of doing art is actually doing the art itself so um it's really enjoyable Here's that blue I want to bring in. As I mentioned a while ago, I want to bring some of the blue that is in the sky into the field. More so just to, for color balance. It's not necessarily that there's this reflection of blue sky in the grasses. Probably not. Uh, but, but again, it's more of an idea of balancing out the colors in the painting. I even added a little more on that uh, tree line off to the right you just saw. When I put the blue down first, uh, I'm a little more here. I felt it was a bit too strong, so I then I then muted it just a little bit. But again, it's a more subtle um, uh, indication of blue um, to better balance out um, the painting. Here's where I'm muting it a bit with a, a little bit of a lighter color mauve, breaking it up again because again, there's grasses here that are going in all kinds of directions mostly vertical but kind of broken off etc so you need to not forget the fact that that's out there and you don't have to see it visually in the painting it's just a, an idea or an inkling that there's masses of, of vegetation uh, running in different directions this is where i had stepped back and looked at the paintings and hey you know i'm going to extend that icy trail a little bit further uh, to the left and then working some of the, we'll call them the tree holes, uh, where the light of the trees in front of this dark mass are being picked up uh, within the dark mass. As I mentioned, the top of this trail is darker, so I'm bringing in a uh, purple-gray hard pastel, um, working through the the trail. And, and there is there is some dimension to this trail in terms of uh, a little bit of ice uh, and snow banks, if you will. So uh, I'll also be bringing in a bit of a lighter pastel to uh, show some of the edges of the uh, snow and ice on this on this trail there was vegetation actually in the trail uh, kind of popped through in some spots so so that's what this pastel is doing it's a great american artworks it's a god i don't know what color it is it's i don't know what to call it it's sort of like a brown mauve but very dark dark color but comes in handy for uh, this particular scene it's interesting how you could find a pastel in your collection that be perfect for a specific landscape <laughs> so so i got to use some of my dull browns and purples in here um, whole different palette if it's springtime and summertime but uh, but for now uh, they all came in real handy i had been doing a bunch of winter scapes uh, so a lot of my blues are getting worn down to nothing blues and pinks i don't think i have plenty of pinks but really it's the blues that are getting worn down so here's my lagoon green here this is a center layer and it's a blue green uh more green than anything else uh pastel and the lower portion of the sky uh, has that green tinge to it so i'm applying that here and uh, another variation that I'll, that I'll do, which you'll see in a moment, is I'll even bring that green closer to the, 
the tree line here. Oh, here we go. I'm doing it right here, which is this is the hard pastel from earlier, the hard greenish blue pastel. So I like to show that here and contrast it with the orange, blue and orange being um, complementary colors, although it's more of a green blue. Uh, but I thought that would be an interesting effect uh, to, uh, to convey down toward the bottom where there was still a little bit of hazy light, light um, flat clouds at the, at the horizon right above that uh, tree line. And this is where you got to be careful to get the orange. Don't want to get the orange in your sky. I think I probably did a little bit there. Um, but again, the blue's got to hug, get it down to hug that orange there. And that's the effect I wanted is to, to build that bit of a, a contrast of hue, contrast of color in the painting. So I thought that looked kind of nice, uh, putting that little, little touch there in the sky. And let's not forget about the sky holes on the little blob of a tree in the back at the end of the trail. Um, so breaking that up a bit, again, with a, a lighter value, uh, that, that I've already placed in the sky, so picking up some of that light from behind. So I'll get it out of the way so you can see some of that, some of that being broken up. Now behind that tree, there is another bright orange tree um, back further in the distance. So we're going to start picking that up here, and that even made the edge a little more nicely contrasted with that little dark tree at the end. So again, that was like, a, what did that take? It's like seven seconds <laughs> to make that small change. You'll find that sometimes making changes that have a, could have a big impact on the painting take very little time. And as I mentioned, when I talked about taking notes, uh, that's an opportunity also to work much more efficiently. So if you look at your painting outside of your painting session on a, on a phone or on a computer screen, and you think and you take those notes when you go back to your studio you can be really efficient in 10 minutes you can have a bunch of changes that maybe finish the painting as i mentioned i was kind of want to get a little more glow at the tops of that that uh, the top of that uh, tree line there on the right another approach which i really recommend is take a photograph of your painting in progress and um, put it up on your computer screen and then use a, a software like uh, Microsoft Paint or Paint 3D and, and you can modify it. And what I did here, which I have not shown in the video, is I took a photograph, well, that's where I got the orange in the sky, but I decided that, that it wasn't that bad, so I, I blotted it out a little bit, but uh, there's still a little bit left in there. But what I did is I took the uh, digital image of the painting in progress and pulled it up on Microsoft Paint. I think it's Microsoft. And drew the cattails in the painting. And um, so here, here are the cattails, the first cattails. I apologize for the uh, image being a little off kilter here. But this is a sharp, dark blue, a dark brown pastel pencil. But I took the digital picture and I put it on paint and then I, I drew these on the paint service and I looked on the paint software and I looked at it and said, okay, that works. I want these these stalks to be somewhat cluttered around and coming out from the right. They, they sort of like do that in the, in the reference photo. But I created it so that I felt comfortable then going to the canvas and actually painting them. Uh, because it's a, this is a point where I don't want to make a mistake, right? And I, but I don't want it to be cluttered. I don't want it to be distracting. So I want to take advantage of software that could uh, allow me to help plan better. Here I'm actually using a black pastel. And I did mention that I do use black every so often. In this particular case, the, there's such a contrast between the stock and the sky and uh, I wanted to kind of convey that, so I brought some black in, but then I have a very sharp edged, deep brown, and also a pastel pencil that's a deep red orange. I'll bring those in here too. I think I even brought in some of my purple. So I, I break up that black. I don't want the black to be the primary color or colorless, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll modify that with a different color. Uh, pastel, but again, it's a dark value. It is one of the darker values in the painting, even though they're very thin. Um, so you kind of lose a little bit uh, as they as they grow higher. Um, 
I also had to remember to add a little more stocks along the path on the right as well as you'll see I'll be adding some more on the left and these are cattails so you'll see the, the rounded um, part of the cattail which is interesting and we'll look at as I look at those uh, if you've studied a cattail uh, you'll notice that the center part is the darkest um, and, and the actually the edges are darker they're more of an orange deep orange color but then, but then there's this this glow around them uh, that you'll see dark around the edges, and um, it's very interesting if you look at how the light impacts the cattail. So, so I'll play around with that a bit, uh, and then there's these little little fluffy tips to the stalks, which will which will will bake in here. The uh, the twigs themselves, there's some white ones and dark ones, so we need to be mindful that some of those have to be identified. Again, not too distracted. Um, the the um, the cattails themselves, when we draw them in, they don't even need to have stalks. You can kind of just draw them uh, on the surface and kind of like floating, if you will, above the above the, the surface. So so we'll, we'll add some of those too in a bit. So for some reason the camera got a bit uh, counter here and. Uh, uh, we're losing some of that uh, that view, but at least we're focusing on this part of the painting, so we're not losing anything here uh, in the in the view. The uh, having a digital reference photo allows you to zoom in and carefully look at the contours of what you're trying to paint, and and it helps to see. The um, really the detail of the cattails or the detail of the ground, detail of anything, in terms of really what are you looking at, what's what's in the field of vision that you should be conveying in some sense in the pastel painting, not in the greatest detail, but you should know what you're looking at. So, drilling down into a uh, digital photograph is really helpful uh, in in creating a, a representation of the landscape that's reasonably accurate. One other thing about like about landscape painting, by the way, is it's, it's, it's that chaos of the landscape. It's not like you're doing a portrait or architecture where you have to be kind of perfect, if you will, in terms of dimensions. So the, uh, the sky's the limit almost in terms of the, the, uh, the variety of, 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 of how you can present a, a landscape. As long as you get the values right, um, and, uh, and some of the relationships of the, uh, of the masses. And hopefully they'll work together and, and, and the lighting of the two. So this is a tricky part. So we don't want to mess up that sky that we worked so hard on, right? So we got to be careful using a very sharp edge of a pastel to get some of these stalks in here that kind of disappear once they're up there. So the tops of the stalks have little, um, little uh, uh, outgrowths and there's also of course the cattails which are kind of oval uh, and come out very dark against that uh, bright sky so we'll throw some of those in here as you can see this is a soft uh, very dark brown pestle I'm using Trying very carefully not to get too crazy here with this detail. Um, it, it can be, as I mentioned early on, it could be rather distracting. But we want some variety in here too. So, so these little, little puffy ends, I should, I should know what I'm talking about here in terms of the vegetation, um, add some variety. And the heights of the stalks add variety. They're all kind of different. and um, Some of them are straight and some of them are uh, crooked and coming out on an angle like this and, and it's actually following the diagonal uh, almost uh, that I had structured earlier on and and part of the diagonal of the um, clouds so um, this is all part and parcel of pointing toward the um, focal point too so the so the stalks are pointing to the 
brightest spot in the in the painting. And then, you know, that's this is where I discovered that I could even grow, uh, create even some brighter sky from the edge of the tallest stalk there up to the top of the tree. So we'll do a little bit of that as we, as we move forward here. So I, I looked at this and then I s stood back and I thought, well, you know, I think I need uh, another straight stalk here. So, so um, that was another uh, change I made, but uh, to these uh, cat tails, but really did not want them to be too overwhelming in the in the landscape and i hope i hope they're not i think i think they worked out uh, quite well This is the first time I decided not to start playing around with the rest of the painting. Notice I not touched anything else other than <laughs> this uh, this vegetation saved for last. You don't want to put these in any earlier, otherwise it would be very difficult. Given that they're so thin, if you had larger trees here, and I've shown this before in the, uh, the Shades of Blue pastel, I put the trees in early on, even before having the background of the snow in there, because they were there was enough gap between them, I was able to work that part of the surface. So. So that, I thought that worked out well. But here you really got to get the background done, get it done, uh, and then overlay these these stalks. Again, apologize for the uh, position of the camera for some reason. It's so off kilter, so can't see what I'm doing there. But again, between these stalks, there's various points of light and shade, and we want to kind of blot some of those in here. Again, the shadiest part toward us and the, and the lighter field in the back there. And this, there's really no right or wrong at this point. It's more of a preference on um, how I want to kind of direct the viewer's attention, what details should be there or shouldn't be there, and breaking some stuff up here. Um, don't forget that there's horizontal as well as vertical stalks and lines in here. The other side also had these cattails that were not as pronounced, but uh, the lighter parts, um, there were lighter glows of the cattail in the centers and then darker. Um, so you'll see me applying some darker pastel on these also in terms of the in addition to the lighter, lighter pastel. Now, I was wondering about that. I was thinking, well, I'm doing all this work on the right with these cattails. Is there any on the left? And I looked at the picture and I said, oh, yeah, there are. Look at that. Uh, not as not as emphatic, but uh, again, there are a lot of, the, they're really in the shade, so you really don't see them as well, but they're there. A little bit of the glow from the sun on the right edges of the stalks uh, and the cattails uh, are done here. Again, I'm using that light orange type uh, pastel pencil, trying to keep it rather sharp as I worked along the um, thin stalks of the cattails. Okay, so now I went back to the trail and I saw that, well, there really is not much blue in there. So I brought some blue in and that also adds dimension. The blue is a slightly lighter value than the darker purple gray that I used that runs through the center top of that trail. So the blue is shaping around some edges of snow uh, that were there caked at edges. They were maybe like a couple of inches high. So they had some, they really did have some dimension uh, there in terms of the ice patches. I like to, like to bring it forward through other parts of the pastel, which I did there on the right. And then I'll take a lighter pastel, one of my, my very light blue one, to create some of the edges that are picking up the light from the sky on the edges of the uh, little snow banks that were varied throughout the uh, throughout that particular icy trail. So at this point, I'm really ignoring the reference photo. It's really now up to me to kind of do what I want to do to this landscape uh, to uh, to make it. Uh, 
pleasing and to finish it. And, and the question is always, well, when are you done? You know, when do you, when do you know when to stop? Um, you can always set a timer and say, hey, that's it, but that doesn't really work very well, I think. I think you, you need to, you need to just kind of decide that when you're making changes that are so minor, that's the time when you stop and say, hey, is this guy going to do anything for me? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it does make a little change, but if it's so small, you begin to think, hey, I think we're getting closer to the end. This is the cattail I decided to draw vertically uh, to help balance out the angular cattails there on the right. And that was it. That's all I wanted to do there, lighten up that background a little bit with a lighter orange pastel pencil. The easel I'm using at the surface is I have a, it's a board, but then I mounted a piece of foam core on it and I could easily um, stick my pastel surface, which is a mounted 9 by 12 UR paper. It's mounted on foam core and it, you just roll up the tape behind it and it sticks pretty well. I have some clasps if I need to use them with soft foam in the inside to help uh, keep uh, not damage the painting. And I'll usually tape stuff on the side of the pastel, like a sketch. Uh, I did the, the simple sketch of the um, layout, and I had that taped to the board also so I could reference it and just as, a, as, a, also as part of the, uh, the demonstration. I also keep a, uh, a sheet of paper taped uh, to the foam core where I could test out some colors, and I can, hold, I can hold them up closely to the painting too to see if the color or the value is the one I want in the particular painting. And that works out pretty well. You can, you can cut up some uh, like heavy stock white paper. Doesn't have to be sanded paper or anything. Cut them up into little squares and you can you know, dab them with a little piece of pastel and hold it up to the painting and see if it works. Uh, and that's another way of picking out your, uh, your colors. I try to define the palette ahead of time. Right after I'll do the sketch and I'll study the photograph and I'll take some notes I'll decide on the palette and I'll separate those pastels out into a uh, like an old meat tray that I've used, a whole collection of white meat trays I have. Um, and I would use that before I set them up on my um, Heilman uh, pastel box, the pastels I want for that particular painting. But I will go back though in my collection and find other ones that I'll use and I'll add to the collection after a while. But I can really start off with the basics just to get set up. So again, we're mounting the paper, we're doing the lattice composition, sketching it out. Um, deciding where I want to place objects in the landscape, if I want to move any around, um, what, do, what do I want to really convey about that painting, what is it about the photograph that's really attracted my attention to it, get all that defined out, then I'll scope out, then I'll go to my like little task list again that I mentioned, and I'll say, okay, what kind of underpainting do I want here? I like to prefer, I prefer acrylic, so what colors will they be, uh, and why, and then and then basically I'll get the palette uh, picked out and uh, we'll just do the, uh, I'll do the, uh, when I do the sketch, I'll spray it with a fixative uh, and then I'll paint the acrylic underpainting, let that dry, which doesn't take very long at all, and then start applying the pastels and that's the, that's the process. I'm trying to convey some of the thin branches of the, uh, the bright orange tree here. And that also will allow us to automatically create more sky holes <laughs> by stretching the, the branches out a bit uh, further. The tree on the left was higher than the one than the bright tree, so I wanted to bring that up also a little bit higher uh, toward, as, a, as a place toward the sky. So the, uh, the video itself, what well, I think we're about an hour and 40 minutes length. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, it would probably be about twice, so much, twice as much time that I did uh, doing the painting. And that would exclude the time I spend taking notes on the painting. So looking at the painting, digital picture, taking notes, modifying it digitally with paint uh, software. Um, so, so again, I'll just keep working back and forth some of the shadows uh, and the darker parts of the trees. 
I decided to work even more highlights into the tree by taking a hard edged Rembrandt yellow pastel here. Now we have to be careful about yellow because it is the first color to disappear in the distance. Uh, I had to be sure that I wasn't really looking at too much distance here by working on this tree and it really wasn't that far off so I felt that the, the fair amount of yellow could survive but you would not want to add it to the, uh, the distant uh, tree line in the back. Here's, here's where I'm adding that arc of light. So right from that point on the right, that cattail, across up through the sky, through the front and up toward the tip of the bright orange tree. So I'm bringing a very light blue in here. It's actually, it's a, actually I believe it's actually a very light pink uh, color. And I'm creating that kind of mystical, um, surreal kind of like, image in the clouds. You don't see that in the reference photo. So this is where artist license comes into play. Where I want to create some sense of lighting impact that's unique to this particular scene. Um, so again, I had to blend it in, but, but again, it kind of focuses all toward that whole area of the painting. Yeah, um, the pastel pencil comes in very handy in in working between the stalks. It's a little tricky here. It takes a bit uh, of a steady hand <laughs> to get this in here, but shaping out some of the stalks by putting in some lighting behind them um, adds a little more variety in there. And again, I want a little more highlight uh, toward the top part there, so I added some more there to trickle down. But as I mentioned, you get to the point where the changes you're making to the painting seem so short and minor, um, little touch up here and there, that those are all your indications that you're getting close to the end. This is a pink pastel. Pink and red. This is one of the uh, my unison lights, which I also really prefer as those uh, lights of unison are, are wonderful sets of lights. Um, I haven't used darks of unison. They have all kinds of sets. And all these uh, brands have various uh, landscape, floral sets, etc., etc. Um, but again, I want to bring a little more highlighted here, so I'll use a unison light, light pink uh, at the uh, left edges of those cloud streaks. <clears throat> Why did the painter get arrested? Because he was framed. This is pretty bad jokes. What do graffiti arts call empty walls? A blank sea. <laughs> That's pretty um, So where are we? So continuing to blend. I think this is the point where watching a pastel painting being made gets very boring. But I think what, what we're doing here is really finalizing, going back, looking at the painting, deciding what I want to blend and what I don't want to blend. The streaks are really cool. So I have this upward motion that I did here uh, up into the blue of the sky uh, to kind of reflect that. Um, it's kind of like a cloud burst, if you will. Um, so again, look at the arc, look at the light arc from the tip of that right, tall right cattail up diagonally up toward the left. And we're working those diagonals and the diagonals are kind of playing out here with the with the structure of the pastel values in the sky. Bring a little more dark blue in there for a little more emphasis, a little more contrast. Be careful, you don't have blue blotches. You have to really blend them in for the sky. 
again, if there was a blotch there, it wouldn't look quite right. Um, so we'd have to kind of blend that in. I think we have a little bit of blotch there on the left. We'll have to, we'll have to get that fixed. Um, so I'll put that on my notes to uh, wrap that up a little, little piece of detail. A little more of that uh, nice blue-green. Actually doing uh, cloud holes, if you will, because there's uh, there's blue behind the clouds, so we want to kind of get some of that in, the, in there. more work on the uh, sky holes. And this uh, this get could be get difficult at points because you you get the sky hole to blend in with the uh, branches and we don't, don't really want to want that so be careful to try to get it to get the sharp edge of the pastel in there and, and try to push it in pretty pretty strongly so that it overlays the branches to create that uh, sky hole effect i mean you can also take a thin but reasonably firm brush and brush out part of the tree but i didn't want to do that the tree actually is pretty much rounded uh, one of the one of the um, um, interesting uh, things about a, a young artist or, or a child artist would be to create a round tree, <laughs> pretty solid. And I feel like I've almost done this, but uh, but again, we've been modifying it enough uh, to to give it the proper tree structure, and it is pretty much rounded in the in the uh, in the landscape uh, in the landscape reference photo. But, uh, working that a little bit further. So the key in doing these paintings is really the planning, planning side of it. So again, you know, scope it out, sketch it out, pick your underpainting, pick your pest palette, uh, take notes. The white pastel pencil I'm using is muting some of that, uh, those sky holes that I put in there to soften them up a bit. White cools off, remember, so it'll cool off your, your, your brilliant colors. A little more of my nice uh, lagoon blue green uh, pastel. I'm going to have to do some tropical paintings someday and use my other tropical type colors. Do you ever look at your palette and realize you have way, way too much of one particular color? So I've got a lot of greens, but I use greens a lot. I also have a lot of pinks. So I'm going to need to think of subjects that, uh, that will take advantage of some of those other hues. A little darker in the foreground again. I want to build a little more contrast here. I'm typically going back and forth and finding areas to build contrast, build highlights, uh, just what feels right and what looks right. And this was uh, done after, again, observing a photograph of the painting in progress and deciding, hey, this is another touch I want to make uh, on the painting. <laughs> Breaking up some of that field on the right, a little more ice patches here and there. Just minor, minor changes at this point. I thought that the edge of the trail should have more of an angular look of bright uh, reflective light. So uh, that's what I did here with this particular pastel. Is uh, it was built uh, again another angle. I like to work angles, uh, diagonals, etc., in the painting. So um, um, that's what I did 
uh, here at the very top of the frozen trail. Breaking up the base of the uh, where that large tree is or that, that dark tree is in the back. Really being mindful of edges to find that there, to convey that there, there's a lot of variety in the edges and breaking them up. Some of the glow from the sun I wanted to bring across the tree, the dark tree at the edge of the trail. So brought that out and brought a little bit of that color into the icy trail up the edge there. And that's really about uh, all we're going to do in this painting. Uh, I think I'll probably have a few more modifications, but uh, but uh, took a bunch of notes and paused the recording, went back and forth, and, and created some uh, various uh, minor changes. So there you go. So um, email me if you like a digital reference photo of this painting, and you can paint along. Watch the video again and paint along with it. And uh, uh, my website is uh, Palmerton Images. Dot com. I've got a gallery there with a lot of paintings, a lot of winter paintings that I've been doing recently. And uh, uh, there's also workshops that uh, I'm scheduled, uh, one in April and one in June. Thanks for visiting.